Well, good afternoon, Ebenezer Bible Fellowship Church. The Lord is good. He is our rock and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? No one, nothing. We have gathered again in the middle of the week to worship the Lord and to study the Word together. So excited about um, what's going to happen today. Pastor Dick is going to be bringing a three-part message series through the book of Habakkuk. And uh, we've been talking about that. I asked him to do that, and he's thrilled to do it, and I'm thrilled to hear it. And I know that you'll be blessed. It is a book that is so appropriate for our day, and I pray that you'll be encouraged by it. A couple of announcements as we begin. First, we hope that you got this book in the mail uh, from us, just simply called Anxiety, Knowing God's Peace, 31-Day Devotional for Life. And we sent that to you. We hope that you'll use it. Uh, Maybe use it uh, in your home, read the devotion together with husband and wife and maybe even the children and let's just rest in the Lord. And so we want you to know that we love you. We hope you got that book and a a sign of our love for you and concern for your spiritual well-being. So we hope and pray that you got that. If you didn't get it, call us, let us know. Maybe we can get you one. Also, secondly, again, we want to highlight the fact that if you need help in any way, Um, We want to be able to be here to give you help or if you're able to give help. So go to aplaceforyou.org forward slash help and there you can find a way to be a help or if you need help from us in any way or from the brothers and sisters at Ebenezer, we want to reach out to you. And then last, number three, we continue to ask you to send your, your pictures in. We want to see your smiling face. We'll put them together at the end of the Sunday service. And um, it really is a joy to see everyone. We miss you so much. Lord bless you. Let's worship together. Jeremy and Heather are going to lead us in some wonderful music. And then Pastor Dick's going to come preach God's word from the book of Habakkuk. So get your Bibles out and let's study God's word together. But first, let's sing and worship the Lord, all right? throne of God above. I have a strong, a perfect peace, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and feeds for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because the sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me hallelujah spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one in himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one risen Son of God. We sing hallelujah.
hallelujahs and our praises. He's the rock of ages cleft for me that we hide ourselves in him and in his strength alone. Rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure save from wrath and make me pure not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands could my zeal no respite, no, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone, thou must save and thou alone, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death and when i soar to worlds unknown see thee on thy judgment throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee oh god that we hide and like the Psalm 46 says, you are our refuge and our strength and very present in our time of trouble. God, that we find our rest and our help in you. And in this midweek service, Lord, I know that your spirit is moving and active. And we pray that as listeners are, are checking in um, now and in the next 24 hours, God, that you would spur in them an encouragement and an understanding that you are holding us fast. You are holding us fast to the hope that is in Christ. And also, Lord, that you would give us the eyes to see and help those who are in need with the hope of the gospel. Whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, mental, God, that you would help us to be the hands and feet of Christ. Lord, um, use us, please, and convict our hearts. I know you're convicting mine just how we need to continue to grow in the goodness and grace of, of God through this time. So help us, Lord. We cry out to you, we thank you, and we praise you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is great to be with you this afternoon, and we sure do miss you all. I know that you're out there. Uh, we hear from you, and we just, I wish we could see you uh, this afternoon. Pastor Tim gave you plenty of warning to try to find the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. It's amongst the minor prophets, and uh, just when you thought that you had, you, you had heard everything that you could probably hear about the Christian and COVID-19, well, I found three more messages that I want to submit to you. However, these messages happened a very long time ago, and they're not just COVID-19 specific. We've all experienced what it is to cry out to God in prayer, asking Him to 
on behalf of a loved one or a marriage or maybe the church itself, that somehow God would awaken his church and bring them back on track so that they would make the first things the first things. Yeah, we live in a society where the culture has so infiltrated our churches that before we know it, we've kind of ventured from our posts and been involved in things like trying to figure out uh, how to navigate through same-sex marriages and homosexuality and abortion and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we find ourselves crying out to God, God, how long, how long will you, will you tarry? Where are you, God, in all these things? Do you even care? Are you tuned in? Well, it's actually the setting in which the prophet Habakkuk, a young contemporary of Jeremiah, uh, was called to prophesy. Habakkuk was writing during a time that uh, the ten northern tribes of Israel had been dispersed by the Assyrians some a hundred years earlier in 722 B.C. And now a new world power was on the scene. And that world power was the Babylonians. The Babylonians gained particular uh, prominence during a great battle called Carchemish in 605 B.C. when uh, the Babylonians defeated Pharaoh Necho uh, who was with his Egyptian army along with the Assyrians. They were allied against the Babylonians and the Babylonians just crushed them. This was also the time when Jehoiakim was king in Judah Benjamin, the southern two tribes that were left, and Jeho Jehoiakim was the son of the great king reformer Josiah. But unlike his father, he had reverted back to paganism and idolatry. It is this context, this context that Habakkuk addresses God. As the letter opens, we read the phrase, O Lord, how long? As a Habakkuk complains to God. Let's read this portion. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 1. And Habakkuk says this, and this, this uh, chapter is very easy to outline. And if you have an a ESV, you'll see that they already have this outlined where Habakkuk's complaint, the Lord's answer, and Habakkuk's second complaint. So we're going to begin with Habakkuk's first complaint in verse 2. Uh, let's start out verse 1. The oracle of Habakkuk, the prophet Saul, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. And then the Lord answers Habakkuk, and he says, Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am rising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dread, dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, leopards more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at uh, rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Habakkuk brings about his second complaint. He says, well, God, are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. 
you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he shall say to me, what I will answer concerning my complaint. Father, we, with Habakkuk, have a lot of questions about what is going on today. What, do, what are you doing, God, and where are you? I pray that this afternoon that you would speak to us through this portion of Scripture that asks a lot of questions and have you answer them. But Lord, it seems that you answer them in a way that we can't understand. Speak to us, O oh Holy Spirit, through your word this afternoon that we may understand your ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The main idea I saw in this passage of Scripture as I read it is that God is actively working, even if it seems He is silent and absent. So God is at work. We may not understand that He's at work, but He is at work. And that's Habakkuk's first accusation against God. The point number one, Habakkuk's first accusation against God in verses 2 through 4, for he says this, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? So Habakkuk is accusing God of what? He's accusing God of not hearing his cry. He's accusing God of not hearing his cry. How is it? that he thinks that God has not heard his cry. Well, obviously, it's because nothing's being done that he can see. He's cried out to God, and God has refused to answer or to do the works that he thinks that he should do. And so because there's been no answer as he sees it, he thinks, he believes that God has not heard his cry. So Habakkuk accuses God of not hearing his cry. God, where are you? I am crying out to you. You know, we can relate to that in so many ways. I know many of us, including myself, for years we've been crying out on behalf of someone. And it seems as if the, the situation gets worse and worse. God, where are you? Why don't you hear me? I'm crying out to you on behalf of so-and-so. But nothing ever seems to change. On top of that, Habakkuk not only accuses God of not hearing his cry, but he says Habakkuk accuses God of not seeing what he sees. It's as if he's saying in verse 3 here, he says, why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. It's as if he's accusing God as kind of staring off in space and is not in, inclined and in, in with him. He's, he's kind of zoned out. He accuses God of zoning out. God, can't you see this evil? It's all around him. And by the way, Habakkuk, when he's bringing this accusation uh, before God, he is bringing it in reference to the children of Israel. Because we know that because of Jehoiakim, who was the son of the great reformer Josiah, Josiah had, had just reformed the whole nation. He had, he had torn, torn down the idols. He had found the book of the law. He read the book of the law and people were transformed by it. And now Josiah had passed off the scene and his 
son Jehoiakim had come to power and had forgotten all these things and had reinstituted idolatry and was part of paganism. And so as Habakkuk looks out and sees this, he says, God, do you see what's going on with your people? Aren't you hearing me? Aren't you seeing the evil that's there? And then in verse 4, we see part number C, Habakkuk accuses God of being powerless to stop injustice. Look at verse 4. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Oh God, can't you see? Your law, your word goes forth, and it does absolutely nothing. People are still pagan. People are still engaged in sinful actions. Habakkuk's complaint in prayer is not unlike our own. So often we look around us and we see these things. We complain to God regarding the sin around us, particularly in the church, how often we as pastors have had the opportunity to sit down with people who are struggling with their marriages or struggling with their children or with some addiction, and we come before them and we open the Word of God and we present to them the truth of God's word. And for some reason, nothing changes. And we become discouraged and despondent. Though we know the word of God is the truth and the power, yet nothing changes. So this is Habakkuk's first accusation against God. God, you're not listening to me. Nothing's changing. Everything's the same. God, you're, you're not seeing what I see. Do you see all this sin around me? Why is it that you seem to be looking past all this? And God, it, it seems that in the midst of all this sin and injustice, that even your law, even your word is powerless against it. What is it that you're going to do, God? The Lord responds to Habakkuk in verses 5 to 11. And the first point is this. The Lord declares that he is doing an unbelievable work. One of the things that the Lord declares to Habakkuk is that though it seems like I'm not listening to you, though it seems like I'm not seeing what's going on, though it seems like that even my word is powerless, nonetheless, I am working. Look at verse 5. He says this, Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. I am working. I am proactively working. When we think about the rise of Babylon, Babylon was just a, a little country when the Assyrians were in power. But in a short period of time after the Assyrians have deported the ten northern tribes, Babylon rose in prominence. They became powerful. And according to what I believe the Lord is saying to Habakkuk, I am the one that's behind this. I have been working, actively working. Even when you, Habakkuk, do not see this work, I am still working. How often that is needs to be the response to us. We assume because God is not doing the things the way we think he should do them and in the timetable that we think he should do them, that he is therefore not actively working. But be assured that God is working. He is actively working. And he's doing what he calls the unbelievable work. It's a work that even Habakkuk will not understand. Secondly, we see that God, the Lord declares that he is using the godless or the Chaldeans to bring judgment. 
This is astounding to think about. God is using the godless to do his work. Verse 6, this is what he says, For behold, I am what? I am raising up the Chaldeans. And he himself describes them as a bitter and a hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings for their own. So, secondly, when the Lord is responding to Habakkuk, he says, listen, I am raising up, I am raising up the godless Chaldeans for my purpose. What is that purpose? To bring judgment upon my people. This is astounding. This goes against everything we know about God, and we'll get to that in a minute because that's basically going to be Habakkuk's second uh, complaint is that this doesn't sound like you, God. But before we get there, I want to make one other point about the Lord's response to Habakkuk. The Lord also, see, the Lord declares that he is using their, the Chaldeans, the godless ones, their own evil wills to perform his purpose. Now, many of us will really struggle at that. God is using the evil wills of human beings for his own purpose? God is using the natural ways of man. He's using the natural ways of creation to accomplish this, his will. Why? Is it because God is sovereign over it all? And this is not a new concept. We've seen this several times in Scripture, right? We know that the story of Joseph and his brothers, how his brothers sold Joseph into slavery. And Joseph ends up in Egypt. He is uh, on the slave of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife accuses him. He ends up in prison. He's there in prison for a number of years until he interprets the king's dream. And at that point, he comes out of prison and is released. And in chapter 50 of Genesis, we read these amazing words. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for I am in the what? In the place of God. As for you, you meant evil. You brothers meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. How about the story of Job and Satan? We all know that Job was a righteous man. He did what was right before the eyes of God. Of course, we know that Satan went into the presence of God and, and demanded to, to try him. And God gave Satan permission to do that. And Satan endured this trial that he didn't deserve. But, Satan, but, but Job was, was, endured this trial. And at the end of that trial, he brings glory to God saying that now I know God. And what was it that brought about this trial? What brought about that perception? Was the trial that Satan, the evil one, had, had, had gone against Job. How about Peter? Peter was, was sifted in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So God had allowed Satan to sift Peter. How about the Apostle Paul with the thorn of the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9? He says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. So God had permitted Satan to harass Paul. And the greatest of all examples of this is the crucifixion of Jesus. Acts 2, 23 says this, just Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So the very fact that God uses evil is nothing new. Now we know that God is not evil, 
God cannot be tempted with evil. He is not evil. He is transcendent, which means he is outside of sin and evil. It has no effects on him. However, God is sovereign and he uses sin, even the sin of human beings, for his own plan. This can be a comfort to us because the reality is someone is sovereign. If evil is sovereign, then we have more of a problem than if God is sovereign over evil. So this is God's response to Habakkuk. So how did Habakkuk respond to that? Well, with another accusation. He says, Habakkuk, second accusation against God in in verses 12 through 2, 1, he more or less says, he, Habakkuk accuses God of not knowing even his own character and forgetting about his covenant people. Look at verse 12. He says, And you, are you not from everlasting? God, do you remember that you're the everlasting God? O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, remember that God? We shall not die. Why should we not die? Because we are your covenant people. And because you are the covenant-keeping God and you are the Holy One, the Eternal One, we, the covenant people, we're not going to die, right? O oh Lord, you have ordained them as judgment and you, O oh Rock, have established them for reproof. How often do we accuse God of not being God because what is going on doesn't seem to line up with his character, right? So we have this character image of God. It's almost like we take God as if he's a grapefruit, right? And you've got all these segments in that grapefruit. And, and so here's, here's love. Yes, God is love. Yeah, we like, we like that one. How about, how about uh, merciful? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's pick that piece too. Gracious, yes. Long-suffering, absolutely. Faithful, yes. Well, what about wrathful? What about just? What about... Holy. What about these other things? We, we somehow think we can take God as, a, as we can a grapefruit. Let's just eat the segments that we like and we can throw away the rest. However, the, the attributes of God are all encompassing. God is all love. God is all holy. He is all wrathful. He is all long-suffering. God is all of these things. We cannot segment God we sometimes become so presumptuous in our evaluation of God or what God is, is in or what he's a part of or not a part of. If, if, if what God is doing is making me feel comfortable, then certainly God is in it. If what is going on in my life, if I have to endure some sort of hardship, so apparently God is not a part of that. Satan is part of that. As if Satan has more power than God. So when Habakkuk accuses God of not having, not knowing his own very character, God, hey, wait a minute. Did, you know, if we remember, remember Peter? He, he did that too, right? He had just declared in Matthew 16 that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you by Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood haven't revealed that to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to declare to the disciples that he was going to die and he was going to be buried and then rise again the third day. And Peter takes him aside, you know, no, no, Lord, that's not, that's not you. <laughs> you are the son of the living God. Remember that? That's your characteristics. Certainly you're not going to die. Jesus declared to him, get thee behind me, Satan. But we have this image of God that we have created in our own image. You know, this image of God that is all loving, all merciful, all gracious. He is, he is forgiving. He is faithful. But certainly he could not allow something evil to happen to us. Certainly not a trial 
We are his covenant people, his covenant community. Habakkuk gets even more intense because the second point here is that Habakkuk actually accuses God of treason by allowing the unrighteous Chaldeans to swallow up his covenant people. Look at the last part of verse 13. Why do you look idly? Uh, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? First of all, Habakkuk has a has a wrong perception of righteousness. He thinks for some reason that there's a scale, that God has a scale, and that he's grading on this scale, and that because we are God's covenant people, certainly the scale is going to weigh on the side of righteousness, and that anybody who is, uh, who is opposing to us is going to be weighing on the side of unrighteousness. So we would, uh, we would see that God would certainly condemn the unrighteous, but save the righteous. And, and certainly we... As God covenant people are the righteous ones. There's something else involved here that may not be evident, but think about the government of that day in, in light of the children of Israel. The children of Israel had a theocracy. Theocracy means that God ruled government. And during that time, they had kings, they, they had the monarchy. Now, the kings ruled in God's stead. There was a co-regency that was going on where as the king ruled, he brought God's law, God's words to the people. So, if you take this people and you deport that king and you bring another ruler in, then that means that God is no longer ruling and he's giving up his throne for someone else. In this case, for the Babylonians. So Habakkuk accuses God by allowing the Babylonians to come in and take over his people that you are engaging in treason, God. You are no longer going to be in control. I can imagine that Habakkuk was thinking about this time and thinking, wait a minute now, um, what I had in mind here was that God was going to do a work like he did in Josiah's day. You know, uh, the people were wicked and Josiah came to the throne and he instituted reform and he brought out the word of God and, and people were changed and transformed. God... That's what I had in mind, not this idea of another nation, a, a godless nation coming in and, 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 and being transported into your throne room, as it were, taking over for you. You know how often we think about that. You know, we've, we can always ask the question, did God allow the COVID-19? Here's where the COVID-19 part comes in, okay? Did God allow that? Is it a judgment from God? I've been asked that question. I don't know if it's God's judgment, but God certainly allowed COVID-19. He has allowed it. But, but, but God, what if this is, you know, maybe in an answer to our prayer, God, I pray that the church would wake up and revive and that people would take seriously your word and what, what you are teaching them as far as them, them as a family, as a husband, as a wife, as, a, as a, a, um, an ambassador for Christ. Couldn't you just bring revival, God? That would be great. Let's let the Spirit of God just fall upon everybody. And where they are, they would be transformed by the power of God. Well, God does things differently than we think. What has COVID-19 done? You know, uh, uh, Pastor Tim and I and, and some of the pastors have talked about, it would be great at the end of all this to have a testimony service. What did God show you during this pandemic? And see the great and glorious things that God has brought about through this. 
Thirdly, we see this. Habakkuk accuses God of allowing the unrighteous deeds of the Chaldeans to continue without judgment. If you read verses 14 through 17, you, you, you see the activity of these evil people. It, not only did they swallow up the righteous, uh, but they are, you made them like fish in the sea, crawling uh, things that have no ruler. He, he brings them up with a hook. As if these people are just relentlessly uh, destroying people who are innocent. And, God, and this godless group has no concern for anybody but themselves. In fact, the things that they do, it's in verse 16, it says, therefore, he sacrifices to his net. In other words, he thinks the activities that he's involved in, that's gr bringing him great gain, have become like gods to him. He worships them. Verse 17, he says, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? God! Is evil going to prevail forever and ever? Are we never going to see you work? Sometimes the unrighteousness around us seems to continue without any sign of ending. And in regard to this, many unrighteous people become so arrogant at their unrighteousness. So Habakkuk presents what he considers a good case before God. God, there's evil all around me. God, don't you see? Don't you, don't you hear? God, God are, are, are you tuned out? Do you, do you not know what's going on? It seems that even your very word is powerless in this day and age. Well, God responds and says, yes, I do see. I am doing a great work. I am doing an unbelievable work. I am doing things that you would not even understand. I am raising up a godless nation. I am raising up godless things to bring judgment or to bring change. And not only that, I'm allowing these things to continue in their natural ways. I'm not going to stop that, that evil person or that evil thing from continuing. I will control it, but I'm not going to stop it. I'm going to bring about my plan. How often in response to that we say, God, that just can't be you. I know you. You are such a loving God. You are a God that gives us hope, and somehow we presume on the fact that because we are God's covenant people, we could never incur his judgment upon us. Yet Habakkuk is going to learn some valuable lessons here. Because the title of this one was, Oh God, where are you? And when we come into next week, we're going to ask the question, Well, then how shall we live? If this is what you are doing, God, then how should we navigate through this time? How are we going to keep our head above water, God? God's going to tell us very clearly. So, some so what's here. Let's, let's look at a couple things here. Are we guilty? Yes, I am, of putting God on trial because the things are not happening the way we think they should. We somehow think that God needs to respond as we have ordained. Do we think that because nothing is going on, that nothing is happening the way we think it should, that somehow God is not at work? Just because there seems to be nothing happening does not mean that God is not working. God is always proactively working. By the way, if we look at the, the all of Scripture, we'll see that God works proactively, never reactively. He's not saying, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. What should I do? No, God is at work. He is proactively bringing about His will. His will will be done. His decrees will happen. 
Is it difficult for us to understand God's use of the control of and use and control over evil. Sometimes that concept is difficult for us to understand. We trip over that because we know that God is pure, He is holy, that He doesn't, lo- He hates sin, and sin was crushed on the cross with Jesus. That's how, how much He hates sin. However, God is certainly able to control and to use it for His glory. So what should we take away from this? I would say we would take away from this that let's not put God on trial because we don't understand what's going on. We don't know how much longer COVID-19 is going to be here. We don't know how much longer we're not going to be able to assemble together. And somehow we think that this thing is in control and God is kind of passively watching. No, God is in control of the whole thing. He knows when the day will come where we can meet again. He knows what life will look like during that time. He wants us to understand that He is in control of all things. Even if we can't understand it, it was difficult for Habakkuk to try to understand how God could use such a wicked, wicked nation like the Babylonians. But God proclaimed that He was. So next week when we talk about this again, we're going to see the burden, the oracle. In fact, that word oracle in the chapter, uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, is really has to do, it's a term, it's a technical term for a prophecy of judgment. Well, right now, it doesn't seem like there's any prophecy of judgment except what Habakkuk is bringing before God. But when we go to chapter 2, we're going to see the judgment that's pronounced actually on the Babylonians. So stay tuned for next week. If you are curious, read ahead, study ahead, and be prepared to come back, and we'll answer the question, what then, how then shall we live in light of all this? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, there are things in your word that are so difficult for us to understand. We somehow have conjured up this idea of who you are and what you do. And when you go out of those boundaries that we have set, we somehow claim that you are not understanding what's going on, that you are not tuned in. Father, help us. Help us in the midst of it all to trust you, that you are at work. You are at work right now in COVID-19. You are at work right now with all that's going on in our nation, in our world, with our president, with our governors. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to be in tune with you, to cry out to you when we don't understand. And fill us with your peace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. I was too engrossed in the message. Uh, We're going to go to a time of prayer right now. We have many prayer requests within our own church family. First, we have a praise for Mike Snover. He's gone home. We're thanking the Lord for that. We continue to pray for his recovery and his wife's recovery. But we also have some requests this afternoon, um, some pretty significant ones. The Selness family are, are batting round two of their uh, COVID uh, virus and their home. Both Katie and Jesse have come down with it. Praise the Lord, the kids haven't come down with it. So we're thanking the Lord for that. So we want to pray for them. Kathy uh, Tobar calls in and asks for prayer for herself, her families. um, Some of them have gotten the COVID virus. um, But she's also asking for prayer for the nursing homes in which she works, works at. It's a real challenge. And of course, all the health workers, we want to pray for them. Betsy Callison will have her surgery coming up to have her thyroid removed on May 12th, so we want to pray for her. I got a recent request from Jill Ibera. She has a brother, a precious brother, who's a believer. His name is Dale. He's had cancer for some time. He's had a brain tumor. He's been undergoing chemotherapy. Well, apparently, one of the hospice nurses had the COVID virus and gave it to him, and um, so, of course, he's still undergoing 
you know, care under hospice, but what I think Jill is mostly concerned about is, she, is he lives with her elderly parents, and so it's just a mess. So would you pray for that family? Pray for Dale Abara and, and his parents. Marcia Silva uh, texted me this week, and her brother George, who had come down with the coronavirus um, in Long Island a couple of weeks ago, recently passed away. So we're really sad for Marcia and ask that you'd bless, uh, ask the Lord to bless the family. Also, John Lamb, he was here for several years. Some of you may have known him. We found out that he passed away on April the 20th, and he was having some real health issues. And we pray that God would do a work in his life. Um, the Labar family, I don't know if you know them. They've experienced a fire in their home, and um, they're asking for prayer for their family as they try to figure out where to live. They're looking for a temporary place to live. And then last, I mean, there's others here, but last, uh, Kevin, our precious, uh, one of our staff members, Kevin Kreitzberger, his father passed away this last week, and I think it was Saturday morning, went home to be with the Lord, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord to be with uh, Kevin and his family. All right, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your mercies in many of our precious uh, families' uh, lives. Mike Snover coming home and um, Lord, other blessings that we see all across our, our church community. But Lord, we also lift up some of these folks who are hurting. I lift up Jill Abera and, and ask your comfort over her and particularly her brother Dale who's we know is passing away and it seems as though you're going to be calling him home soon. But we also pray for uh, his parents who are elderly and they're in the home now with the virus. And we pray that you would protect them, that you would give comfort and peace to Jill and the rest of the family. Lord, comfort Marcia uh, Silva. She's lost her brother, Lord, to this, um, this disease. Lord, we also pray for others who have lost loved ones. Um, we pray for Kevin Kreitzberger, our precious brother in the Lord, whose father passed away and we know that he is with you, but we pray, Lord, that you would comfort them, comfort the family and strengthen them as they're grieving the loss of really a wonderful man of God in their life. Lord, we pray for the Labar family. We ask your blessings over them. We pray that you'd provide for them. Continue to provide for Jesse and Katie Selness and the Tobar family, Betsy Cowison as she undergoes surgery, for Joanne Winkle's um, uh, little grandson, Matthew's father, uh, Raymond, who doesn't know the Lord, and he's now come down with the positive with the coronavirus, and we ask, Lord, that you would do a work in his heart and save him. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to come to pray. We know that our prayers are not in vain. We come to you only by the blood of Jesus. We're so thankful, Lord, that you will do a work in these people's lives. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue to lift up some of the people on our list and particularly want to focus in on some of the missionaries, uh, Luke and Gretchen Raleigh, uh, Jim and Lynn Head, and John Bovard, and uh, Russian Radio, and uh, Mark and Shannon Fodell, and uh, Art and Vic Vicky Reyes, Reyes, and uh, Kyle and Rebecca Kovar, Koval. So these precious people are our missionaries. And they are experiencing very similar things that we are experiencing and yet don't have many of the comforts that we have. So let's go before our great God and bring them to him. Father, we thank you and praise you that we can come before you in prayer, that you do hear our prayers. You are tuned in to our words and our world. Father, I want to bring before you Luke and Gretchen Raleigh and in their work in the world impact in the cities of our nation. Father, I pray that they would continue to be able to bring the good news even in the midst of, of a time where people are so broken and we are, we are so closed in. I pray that you would continue to help them and continue to protect them and guide them into how they can continue with their ministry. We pray for our brother and sister Jim and Lynn Head. I pray that you would help them um, 
in the, the final stages of, of Lynn's book she's writing, I pray that you would help them physically and, and they would have a personal renewal. I pray that you would give um, Jim uh, the ability to be able to sell their parents' home and uh, that he would continue to be able to do effective counseling. We pray for John Bovard, uh, who is a part of the Lehigh Valley Youth for Christ. I pray that you would continue to be able to reach out to these Youth for Christ families for their health and for their safety, and the prayers for the kids that are a part of the virtual campus life clubs. Father, what a great time to have the technology to be able to continue in ministry, and that the Bible studies would continue throughout the week. We pray for the Christian, uh, Russian Christian radio, that, Father, you would, you would help the people, that they would come under the sound of the gospel, even though they are sheltered in, that they would hear the, the word of God being proclaimed in their language. We pray for Mark and Shannon Fodell with Disciple Makers. I pray that you would continue to comfort them and the students that are in the midst of a time of great disappointment where they are not able to graduate or continue on in, in their classes. I pray that you would help them to be able to uh, minister, even if it's virtually, with, with the ministry of the Word of God. I pray for the financial pressures that they are undergoing. I pray that you would meet their every need I pray for Art and Vicky Reyes in, in Mexico. I pray, I pray that you would, they would find ways to feed and encourage the flock there during these unprecedented times. And Father, I, I, I pray also for Kyle and Re Rebecca uh, Covo in, in Italy. I pray that you would help them and, and that you would continue to help them to be guided in the way they can share the gospel with others and disciple them. Father, I thank you for their praise that they've been blown away at the opportunities that you have given them. Even this past week, they, they have been able to, to come alongside of people and to be able to give them time and to disciple them and to meet their needs. I pray also that uh, you would help them as they are looking forward to a disciple-making movement in uh, Ancona in 2024. Father, that you would provide for them, allow them to continue to do this work. Father, we know that though coronavirus is here, that your work continues to go on, that there is nothing that thwarts your plan. Be with your servants your people who are, who are on the front lines, who are proclaiming the gospel, who are discipling, who are helping people. Father, I pray that you would give them a sense of your presence and, and the grace that they need to continue on. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Again, it's a, a privilege every week to come before the Lord in prayer, and I'm greatly encouraged by Pastor Dick's message, and we consider Habakkuk and the fact that he brought his full emotions to the Lord and that the Lord did not turn his face from him. In fact, the Lord continued to engage him. So we understand that there's frustrations and trials, but we are thankful for a God who is big enough to handle that when we take those to him. I have an opportunity to pray for our broader community, so why don't you join me at this time? Father God, we continue to cry out to you for protection. God, we cry out to you um, for peace and for hope in the midst of what can seem like such a chaotic and, and hopeless situation. But Lord, you are putting people in uh, the path of this disease in order to serve others. We think of the doctors and healthcare workers. Uh, specifically now, we really want to lift up these extended care facilities that seem to be the facilities that are getting hit the hardest. God, may you provide protection. May you provide wisdom. Lord, if there's new measures of treatment, would you make them available uh, to these places, Lord? You uh, value our life. You really do. But we understand, too, that uh, our sin has led to a broken creation and a creation that leads us uh, to death. Yet, God, you have sent Christ uh, in our place for the judgment that we deserve. You have sent him there. And, and those of us in Christ are going to celebrate eternity with you, God. I pray that through this, more and more people would come to Christ that they wouldn't turn to other things to find peace, but they would turn to you, that they would turn to your word. God, I pray for all the frustrations uh, that are mounting for people. Uh, we see demonstrations and protests, and God, we don't know the answer, but you do. 
I pray for peace among neighbors who might uh, be angry at how their other neighbors are handling situations, for the people shopping in stores, for the staffs of those stores, Lord. It just, it feels so intense in many ways. And so, God, I pray for peace. I pray that we would love one another well. I pray for our governors and the decisions that have put, been put before them, Lord. We think of this three-stage kind of approach to reopening our country and and God, that is a tremendous amount of pressure and decisions. And while we may agree or disagree with some, God, I pray that we would be lifting them up in prayer. I pray that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them insight. I pray that you would give us a passion to see these things happen. I pray that we would lay uh, beside our differences, Lord, and we would be united and crying out to you for deliverance. Lord, crying out to you for hope. We pray specifically for the Lehigh Valley that seems to be hit so hard right now. Uh, by this virus, God, would you continue to provide doctors and uh, the medications and the equipment necessary to treat these things? But most of all, God, we pray that your gospel would go forth, that through all of this, your church would be strengthened, that through all of this, uh, many people would come to claim you as their Savior. Lord, that we would rejoice at the end of this, that this was a revival season. All that we have struggled through and all the hardships that may come would matter not as we see your church grow and expand. God, may we be people who truly believe that. May we be a church and a congregation that knows that you are at work. That we would proclaim the excellencies of you who's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. May we trust that marvelous light. May we rest in that. And may we turn to Christ in our moment of need. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you joined in with us. Psalm chapter 34 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And that's what we're doing. We're taking refuge in him. So we're thankful that you joined us. Come back again on Sunday. We're going to start a new series in Romans chapter 8. I'm so excited about that series, More Than Conquerors. For 10 sermons, we're going to be looking at that wonderful chapter together. Uh, declared as probably the greatest chapter in all of the Bible. So it's a storehouse. It's a treasure chest of the glories and blessings of God to his people. And so we're so excited about starting that series on Sunday. Lord bless you. Hope you have a wonderful week. Keep the Lord first. Amen. just going to finish with this song, He Will Hold Me Fast, to Him who is able to keep us from stumbling. And when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. And when the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast and i could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Oh, oh, oh. And those He saves are His delight. Christ will hold me fast and precious in His holy sight. He will hold me fast And he'll not let my soul be lost His promises shall last Bought by him at such a cost He will hold me fast Oh, oh, oh. he will hold me fast He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Oh, 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 oh. 
For my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast And justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast And raise with him to endless life He will hold me fast Till our faith has turned to sight when he comes at last oh, oh, oh he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast oh, oh, oh For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. And I'll finish with this doxology from Jude. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen bless you today and the rest of this week and we hope to see you again uh, this Sunday as we pre-record the service. Have a good day.